Thank you, Paub. Um, I'm Claire Hudson. Welcome to this very special event. There should be some rather special people materialising any minute, but I can't see if they're here. Um, Jane Tranter, are you here? Yes. <laughs> I don't know whether I'm. I don't know where you want to sit. I, I don't know where I want to sit. So I'm just, just choose a seat. Right, Lyra, are you here? <laughs> Daphne Keen. <laughs> and I don't know whether anybody wants to sit next to Mrs. Coulter, but I am reliably informed that she's here in the form of Ruth Wilson. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. And Clark Peters, the master. I can't see him. Oh, here he comes. He's proceeding down the dining hall in a magisterial way. <laughs> and Joel Collins, um, please have a seat. Joel Collins, a production designer. Welcome. Well, we can all sit down now. Um, right, I want to start first with you, Daphne. Um, and I guess, firstly, to say, uh, it almost feels wrong to say that's an incredible performance because it doesn't feel like a performance. For those of us watching it, you are Lyra and you take us through the whole of that episode. You're in virtually every scene. I just want to know a bit about how you prepare yourself for that kind of role. And had you read the books? Um, no, I hadn't read the books, which mm, was unfortunate because now I'm a massive fan. Um, but no, I hadn't read the books. I did. I was at the. They were like, "Have you read the books?" I said, That's "Yes." What you do. That's what you do. You have to do that. Yeah, <laughs> got me the part. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so no, I hadn't read the books, but now I've read all. Like I'm halfway through Secret Commonwealth right now. Brilliant book. Um, and I don't, for preparing the part, I usually rehearse at night with my mother. I run through the lines, I think of what the character would do, I think about what I would do in that situation, and I just kind of live it and have fun with it. Well, it, it's an amazing performance, and I suppose, I suppose one of the things that comes through really strongly there is it, it's, you know, you're, you're a child in that story, and I guess you're thinking a lot about children watching it as well, and thinking about all these very unreliable adults. Who can you trust? Who's going to be scary? Who's going to be a friend? It's, it's, a lot of it is about how children see the world, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, can we really trust adults in our own world? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's kind of... I think the story of Lyra is someone who trusts everyone completely, by the beginning of the show, and then by the end of the show, her confidence is shattered. She trusts no one. And I think that's just a lovely arc. Mm. Mm. Apart from, yeah, pessimism, guys. And the, and the problem is, Mrs. Coulter is so convincing, isn't she? I'm, I'm almost convinced by her there. I think she's really nice. I mean, she comes... <laughs> And that's kind of part of it, is that you, you, you... But actually, you are slightly doubtful about her, even there, aren't you? I don't think Lyra is. I think Pan is, because right. Pan is always, like... He's the more intuitive part. Lyra's like, let's do it! And then Pan's like, mm, wait, hold on, let's think about this. Um, and I think what really draws Lyra to Mrs. Coulter is the fact that she lives in this slightly... OK, let's say it like this. It's very unglamorous. Jordan College is not full of beautiful, glamorous, intelligent women. And then this woman who suddenly walks in. Harsh. Very harsh. Right, well, sorry, Clark, <laughs> but it's true. Um, <laughs> she walks in and she's like, oh, my God, I've never seen someone like this ever in my life. And then she appears with her extremely scary demon, which somehow I don't even notice. What's that about? Um, and she sees her and she starts, this amazing woman starts complimenting her and saying how amazing she is and asking her about the roofs and about Oxford and about, it just, I think it just overwhelms her and that's how she gets there. And what was the hardest thing about working on it for you? Oh God. Um, I think probably the most challenging is the demons, but we had amazing people behind us who really, really helped. So they made the hardest part easy. 
We'll talk about demons in a bit. Um, Jane, can I just ask you, I mean, you clearly picked the person who was made for this part, but you looked at a lot of people. Uh, how did, what made you choose Daphne for the part? Um, actually, Daphne was um, probably the first um, actor that we discussed um, because we knew a little bit of her work already. Um, and she did a great self-tape, even though she thinks she didn't, but she did. Um, and uh, um, she was one of the first people we saw. But like quite often in life, you think, well, that's the first person, so it can't possibly be the case, and we must keep looking. Um, and, uh, and we production took a bit longer to get together because of the funding and the complexity of it. And um, we, we did... We w went everywhere. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that Daphne was the best and the only choice. We looked absolutely everywhere, uh, and we came back to Daphne. Um, and there was one uh, day that I will never forget when um, Ruth Wilson, who we'd cast as Mrs. Coulter, came in to um, uh, read with Daphne. And we, I've still got the shot of the two of them on the monitor looking like mother and daughter. Um, and, and the chemistry with them was so extraordinary. Um, but Daphne's spirit and her intuition and her sense of Lyra was exceptional, and I'm very, very grateful. We should also um, mention, but she's gone, Daphne's mother, Maria, who mm -hmm. is an absolutely, I don't know, Maria, are you still here? She's an absolutely exceptionally gifted and talented acting coach, and... Um, I am not saying that it's Maria, but Daphne's performance is uplifted and heightened by the work that Maria does, for sure. I could definitely not do it without her, like, 100%. Oh. Maria, where are you? <laughs> She's That's missing her Oscar moment. in the making. <laughs> um, Jane, you, you've been trying for years to make his dark materials. Um, what's it feel like to finally... Here is episode one. We've all seen it. It's wonderful. What does it feel like after all this time? Uh, very. It's. It feels. Um, feels very emotional. Um, I. Uh, we've just. There's a whole screening going on now with like 500 crew members. Um, I feel over overwhelmingly grateful, uh, and I feel complete anxiety about season two, which we're currently working on. Um, so it's a kind of like it's like just like his dark materials is all about these sort of multiverses. Um, this is all about these different feelings and this is kind of like elation and gratitude and then sheer panic that is always somehow at the edges of all we do on his dark materials, thinking, how are we going to do that? Um, mm -hmm. and, and somehow everybody just does. And it's a really, it's a really difficult tightrope to walk because you're talking about not, not a national treasure, it's an international treasure. It's sold you know, 20 million books worth worldwide. But there will be lots of people watching it who have never read those books. And you're kind of, you've got this huge kind of uh, readership who will be watching your every move and wondering whether you've honoured this amazing um, literary product. And then there'll be people who know nothing about it. How do you kind of keep that balance? Um, I, I do think that's where you sort of have to have nerves of steel. Um, I think that we got, and you know, you have to hold your sort of core in place at all times because... Um, whilst uh, we're very lucky to have such an amazing property to work on. As Philip Pullman himself would say, the key to an adaptation is in that very word, and it needs to be adapted from the pages of the novel to the screen. Um, and so you have to make changes, or you have to pull out certain things. Um, and I think at that point, you really sort of almost need to put your blinkers on. It's like you sort of swallow the book whole, and you really understand its essence, and sometimes you adapt it directly, page to, page to screen, and other times you, you make these great leaps um, and you adapt the essence of it. So, for example, Mrs. Coulter um, has absences from the page in the novel, and we worked a lot with Philip to say, OK, well, what would she be doing? What might be happening? Um, and I hope that the fans will get, things, will get to see things which are, are the hinterland of what Philip wrote, 
as well as see things which they recognise, like the retiring room, for example, which they recognise as um, absolutely from the pages of Philip's work. Great. Now, I'm going to talk to Mrs Coulter. I'm very, very nervous about talking to Mrs Coulter. Don't be. <laughs> don't be. <laughs> um, I, there's a wonderful phrase that you, you've used about it. You, you said you were deeply attracted to the part because she's mother of all evil and a cesspit of moral filth. How do, you, how do you set about playing somebody like that? It's quite easy. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. No, it, it, that was obviously those descriptions. of. I was looking for descriptions of her. Well, when you're reading it, you're like, well, that's pretty amazing. I can't turn that down. And um, uh, I don't know. It just I thought this is an extraordinary woman and character that is constantly... Um, I, I, I haven't got a clue what she's about, <laughs> in a way. Or she's um, mysterious and forever unknowable. And you keep trying to dig in and you keep coming to more questions. That's what happens with Mr. Coulter. And we can have endless discussions about her and still, and all of us come to a different conclusion or have our different ideas. And that, for me, is essentially what's really exciting about playing her is that you can never really know and you can't really ever sort of find a solution to her. So she's always organically moving and changing. And in a scene, she's, you know, she's manipulating, she's a master manipulator. So she knows what other people want and she knows how to give it to them. Um, but she can turn on a dime. So mm. she's constantly keeping everyone on their toes. And I, I love playing that, it's great. Because, because the risk is that she becomes two-dimensional in that sort of pantomime. Yeah, and that's Definitely. what we were. It's it was um, it's been really exciting working with Jack and with Jane and everyone else because we the psychology of her is fascinating. And for me, the key was always about her monkey and her relationship with her monkey and Brian, who's here somewhere. Brian Fisher up there. He um, he's amazing, and he's our head yeah. puppeteer. And yeah, <laughs> woo! -hoo! But early on, we, uh, Jane and Jack and Dan and everyone decided to use puppeteers to help us with the demons. And um, it's been really amazing because, you know, they're people who have emotions themselves. And so when you're working with a puppeteer, you're actually working with a human being and it becomes a dynamic that is really real and, in essence, another character. Um, and they are yourself, so you have to... You're yin and yang. You have to work out how you work together in a scene. And for me, Mrs. Coulter, the arc of her journey throughout the three seasons will be reflected through her relationship with Monkey. Um, so I work very closely with Monkey. <laughs> 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 and, and really, Monkey and Russell, is Russell here as well? Russell does all the CGI, so Russell, there he is. And everyone Woo! at... <laughs> and um, everyone at Frame Store who work on all the demon and everything, CGI behind, you know, in post. It's really the three of us that have created Mrs. Coulter because Mrs. Coulter is monkey and Mrs. Coulter. So, um, but that that psychology for me is 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 really detailed and and uh, fascinating, and we keep finding more things about it. So uh, that's why she's mm. amazing to play. And and this, I mean, obviously you've got a lot of scenes with Lyra, and we've talked about. Well, it not as many as I hoped, actually. <laughs> we don't have that many. <laughs> But yes, no. no. I, hope that, I hope we'll see more. Yeah, you know. Well, well yeah, we have will. intense <laughs> ones. We have, which yeah. make up for the ones we don't have. Yeah, well, we, yeah. The next episodes, like, yeah, a lot of us together. But I just wonder how. Uh, what 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 does it feel like playing those scenes with her, with her? And uh, do you end up kind of finding yourself worrying about how she's going to feel afterwards? When you at, when at you first I did, but I realised very kind of early on. <laughs> That Daphne's a tough cookie, and um, even in the audition, I was like, "Gosh, she's quite intimidating, Daphne," because she just <laughs> looked at me, and I was like, "Wow, she's not, she's not blinking," and I'm going to look back at her, right, with a stare out, and um, she was not, she was not going <laughs> to. I was like, "I lost, I totally I, I lost." I ain't backing down. So, oh yeah, she didn't back down. So I was like, "All oh, right, oh she gosh." She has an amazing stare. That's yeah, great. yeah. So I was like, "All right, this one, okay." I'm, she, I've met my match, and I. I Actually, I said to her early on, I'm sorry, I'm going to be really mean to you in this scene. But she was like, yeah, fine. <laughs> but she did. She gave, gave as much as she got. And um, it's really lovely working with her because um, all those scenes have such an interesting dynamic. And I think there is something really fascinating about... Actually, Tom Hooper did say something to me early on. He said she just... Mrs. Coulter really doesn't know how... She's a bad mother. She's not very good at it. You know, she thinks she's got this nailed. And actually... 
she can't cope and she's completely useless, <laughs> you know, in, in some ways. And when, when faced with her child, she is actually completely out of control. And um, that was really interesting, actually, as a note and how Mrs. Coulter deals with her own, mm. this, this thing in front of her that she thought she could be control quite easily. Mm. Clark, you, you, you are literally left holding a baby within about five <laughs> minutes. And then you, you're trying to kill somebody within about 15 minutes. It's, it's, it's a complex part you've got there because <laughs> we're also told you're quite a good man. Yes. I mean, um, how, how, how did you approach that? Because it, it's, it's quite an ambivalent figure, isn't it? Yes. Um, what's ironic is, is you know, I, I take the child from the man I'm going to kill, <laughs> you know. And um, and knowing that, but it was difficult to do. I mean, it's 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 it's. Do we follow the party political road, or do we follow our humanity? You know, and what is the right thing to do? Um, and I think that um, he followed his humanity. You know, this is this is his child. This is his child. You know, and that he's letting he's letting go. Daddy wasn't always there. And now he's going to come and snatch this this thing away and and flip and flip the world around. And that alethiometer is is plays a major role in those decisions. You know, I wish wish we had one now, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. don't Boy, I wish we had one now. So had you, know, you had you read the book before? Uh, not before. It, I think it was on our shelves at, uh, at home. I thought it was a children's book, and when I got into it, um, I thought, wow. Why haven't I read this before? You know, because it, it's not it's it's not just for children. You know, the issues that that um, that Philip discusses or that he explores are issues that we as adults in the world today, politically, spiritually aware, should be looking at. You know, it's a great journey for for um, for children to read because it's a wonderful adventure. Mm -hmm. You know, you have all these wonderful characters, bears and zeppelins and and magic and cutting through this and all sorts of stuff. You know, that, that's, that's fascinating for a child's mind. But I think as well, the layer of politics is very interesting for an adult to, to, uh, to explore. And of course, children are great philosophers, aren't they? Oh, yeah. So, so there's a lot about good and evil that, that children mm -hmm. will be exercised yes, by in a particular yes. way. Did you say exercise or exorcise? Well, <laughs> <laughs> exercise, but you could be right about both. But yeah, I mean, there are all those levels that you're you're needing to play it at as yes, well. Yes, yes, and, and and hopefully, you know, uh, through time, you'll you'll see. Um, someone was asking me this this very same question: Is he good? Is is he bad? And I I can't answer that. I think that you'll have to wait till you see Lyra's complete journey. And then reflect back on on the master's actions to determine whether he was good or bad in that. Mm. You know, at this point in time, and particularly at this point in time, I can't say. <laughs> I'm not at liberty to say. Joel, can can I just ask you because uh, I think Philip Pul Pullman's gone on record saying that one that the world you've created is how he imagined it. Um, that's an incredible thing to say, isn't it? Well, I think the key, the key to the world building on the show is to not overplay that hand, really, and do it subtly. And I think um, there's a core team from Jane and Dan working with myself, Dan May, and Russell Dodgson, who Ruth talked about. And I think we've all tried to handle the creation of those worlds quite carefully so that they build gently. And they don't, you don't bump in and go, oh, God, this is a fantasy show, but you... You navigate your way through the characters, their demons, the worlds they're in, and you don't find it jarring, but it gets big. Characters get big. Demons get big, and bears get even bigger. And I think the whole thing goes kind of mental. But the truth is, if you, if you, if you don't build that world and, and do it carefully from the start, I think it would, it would jar from the start. So what's interesting is the first episode is quite naturalistic. There's hints and bits and details, but they're, they're, they're just uh, like entrance level kind of details, as it were, to where we go. And, um, and that's part of the books. I mean, that's how it works. You know, it's Oxford, but another one, and it's London, but another one, and, and the characters are ones you identify with. And, uh, and we would have done a very bad job, I think, if we had gone in too big from the start. So. I mean, I think what we've done is amazing from the start, but it, it wasn't about world building. It was about character building and mm. story building and 
and building a people within it. Because it starts to dawn on you, doesn't it? You think, oh, well, hang on a minute, they haven't got phones, they haven't got this. But it's not all at once, it's kind of... Yeah, and, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's it, like we've all known, it, if you know the books, it just gets so big and gets so mental that you, you, you've got to pace yourself and find your way through. So um, I think the art to doing stuff like this is, is to do it, what, do it the way, it's like as Jane said, we all take big risks. Uh, even the alethiometer, which everyone from the movie saw as round. Yeah, it's square. And it's square, but no one said, that's not how I saw it, except the one person who had a tattoo and went, oh. <laughs> um, and that was a bit shocking when they won a prize to come and visit the set. And I said, look at this. And she went, hmm. You know, and then looked at us. Uh, but beyond that, people haven't jarred with it because, um, because it, it's not such a far-reached thing. I think the other side of, of, of what we had to do was try and reinterpret the the books in a very sensitive way so that we didn't go too far into steampunk or too far into a nostalgia of Victoriana because I think the modern audience may not recognise that as a, as, a, as a way, as an access point. So we had to assess our, our way through without taking it into those directions as well. But I think we've, you know, from this one episode, it's just the, like I say, the kind of opening. It goes bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> and the... And the the demons. How do, I mean, that it's interesting. We've already heard about working with a puppeteer, but they, they are kind of a crucial part of the way you you've introduced us to that world. Yeah, the, that the it was all come uh, like I say, it all came really hand in hand, and we've had to work very closely with the puppeteers. But ultimately, uh, like I said, the, the, there's a kind of interesting core team from the writing through to the to the to Russell and his team, who are kind of almost the inhabiting the demons in a vis effects level and Dan May is inhabiting the environments and then there's the kind of the, the global world building and the demons are what's interesting is just like everything else on episode one the demons are very sensitively handled um, uh, but what was interesting is how you guys needed the connection of the human um, with you you know your, your puppeteers and how it gave you the reaction and we kind of knew that. I think we knew that from the start. I know Dan McCulloch, who, who's not here, but he, off the bat, uh, knew some people from the stage um, stage show, and, and he was like, these guys would be great, you know. And right from the start. And by the way, he also told me exactly he was going to be in the cast, even though you were still casting. <laughs> he got it right. <laughs> <laughs> he was, it was like, it? this is my dream. This is like two and a half years ago. This is like the dream cast and, and he, he got it right oh yeah yeah he, he smashed it you know like because he kind of really knew who was going to be right for the show mm -hmm. even though you're going through the process of of building relationships with the cast but i think it's um the the demons are were, were a journey for us all how do we do it we had bean bags we had um <laughs> Long things like, I mean, it's hilarious. People watch the rushes and just laugh when it's, it's really serious. Scene, tech, everyone's just it? laughing their heads off <laughs> because it's just a rod with a ball on it, and someone's like, <laughs> you know, and it's it, it's and we all and the, and the other side of that is people just literally saying, "You're all mad. This will never happen. You'll never be able to do this. What are you doing? And you'll never get to the other end of it because it looks so bonkers. It looks like you're just we're all mad, you know, on the set. But um, so we, there's a huge, yeah leap of faith I think but it's exciting to get to this point um, Jane w w one more question and then I'm going to be asking for questions from you guys out there um, uh, I mean one, one of the phenomenal things about this is that every aspect of the studio production was here in Wales that's almost a first I would imagine were there any particular challenges about being committed to doing it that way um, I, I would say probably the opposite um, as soon as I finally got my hands on the rights to his dark materials uh, we began um, Natasha Hale and myself began to look for studio space in Wales that was going to be big enough for it so we were in the early very early days of development with the BBC they were on it right from the get-go um, and I because it is I knew it was going to be madness um, and I felt that if we were in a studio, we could tether what it really needs to be all about, which is text and performance, 
and um, and let the craziness all around it happen. But there would always be that. You, I could absolutely guarantee that there would always be that moment, that sort of sanctity of text and performance around the camera, which is much harder to do on location. Um, and it's particularly much harder to do on location if you're filming across winter months. Um, and because of the magic of Joel and the magic of Dan May and the magic of Russell, we were able to build and create worlds in a studio, which is why it looks so epic and huge. Um, and it takes, it, it then forces a, um, Jamie Childs, um, who directed episodes seven and eight of season one and is directing five out of the eight episodes of season two, um, kind of like really showed us there is a sort of intensity that stage work brings that really, really works well with the tonality of, of the piece. Um, and so I, I think it, it wasn't really a challenge, it was more a breakthrough. And, and doing it in Wales was something you're already used to? Oh, doing, doing it, it, well, doing it in Wales was, um, was a gift. Uh, I think I've, I've spoken before about, um, I did this show in New York called The Night Of, which is a show, um, contemporary piece in New York, which is all set apparently on those mean streets of New York. Um, and it was um, it was actually filmed very very slowly, and for, it seemed to me for the best part of two years I was sitting in a studio in New York, recreating what was absolutely you know uh, sort of like twenty foot outside, um, and and I I felt a those New York crews are absolutely amazing, and they reminded me of the crews that we'd worked with in Wales, um, both on Da Vinci's Demons and Torchwood and Doctor Who back in the day. And I just began dreaming, really, of... Um, at the time, I didn't have the rights to his dark materials, but I began dreaming of the kind of thing that we could do um, and that we could do in Wales. And um, everyone, the Welsh Government, BBC, everyone has just been... Uh, BAFTA tonight um, has been so welcoming um, of, of supporting us on a journey that I don't really think we could have done anywhere else. I can't imagine anywhere else in the UK or in the world where we would have been surrounded by that um, particular commitment and conviction of those Welsh crews. Uh, and they have both lifted and loved this piece onto the screen. Lovely to hear that. <laughs> OK. Um, there are mics here. Here's Ellen with a mic. Uh, can, we, can you put your hand up if you have a question? Please say who you are. Hello? Sorry. Um, it's Carl Marsh from Bus Magazine. Um, it's a question to, well, any of them, actually. Um, <laughs> um, the books act as a retelling of John Milton's Paradise Lost, and they attracted a lot of controversy for his critique of religion. Um, how was the TV adaptation of Shakespeare? Has it been watered down like the film was or not? Guys, do you mind if I answer this one? Um, and then you sure. Them? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, <laughs> the uh, television adaptation um, has um, committed um, to adapting Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials. And in so doing, we will tell the story that Philip Pullman tells in His Dark mater Materials, um, which is, and we won't water down anything. Believe me, you know, in His Dark Materials, there is the word dark. And we do go to some very, very dark places, not just with Mrs. Coulter, but with other characters as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, we will adapt what Philip Pullman adapts, wi uh, wi what Philip Pullman writes, which is essentially Philip Pullman does not like anything in society which suppresses uh, knowledge or oppresses the people. It's not an attack on organized religion per se. It's an attack on absolutely anybody who tries to seek control by suppressing the truth. And um, sadly and darkly, there's never been a more appropriate time to adapt these books. So the words watering down are simply not in the vocabulary of the group of people who are making his dark materials and nor are they in the vocabulary of the BBC and HBO who are working with us on this. So any of the themes, any of the resonances that you are picking up on in the novels, you will see in our screen adaptation. Yes. Okay. Any more questions, please? Hi. Um, 
Massachusetts of Journal is at the University of South Wales. I want to ask uh, the antagonist, uh, uh, Marisa. Mm -hmm. How can First someone terms, so yeah. cruel <laughs> and merciless like Marisa have such an intense love for Lyra? Uh, can you say that again? Can you repeat the question? Yeah. How can someone so cruel and merciless like Marisa have such an intense love for Lyra later? Um, I think everyone's capable of everything. So um, I sort of, I don't believe in black and white. I think everything's grey. That's why I'm wearing grey. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I sort of think that's what's human about everybody. We have capable the duality of, you know, we can do everything and feel everything. And I think there's something, um, as you see Mrs. Coulter throughout, you'll see her... I don't think she understands quite her intensity that she has, or the feeling she has for Lyra until she faces her and until she loses her and then she has to get it back again. So um, I think there's many reasons why she feels like that. It's it's a instinct, but there's also a control issue. <laughs> um, sure. And a <laughs> major control issue. And and many other things. I mean, that, like I say, I think humans are capable of all sorts of horrific and wonderful things. So um, she's just an extreme example of that. And what will be uh, the extremist scenes where we will see Marisa appear in the series? The most extreme scenes? Yeah. You can ask Jamie Childs about that. Um, <laughs> probably uh, a few at the end. Well, I don't know what's the most extreme scene. Probably Jane. Which is the most extreme scene? I think you're going to have to watch and find mm. out for yourself. Yeah. yeah. Say that. yeah. yeah. I, I mean, there's quite a few, so don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Somebody up there. Uh, good evening, everyone. Did you shoot most of it in the Ellen Valley or up in North Wales? Because the scenery of the mountains are so beautiful. And uh, so I'm wondering whether you ventured that way. <laughs> Mid Wales. Did you go to Mid Wales? Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> we were in Cardiff Bay. And, uh, Brecon Beacons. And the, the Brecon Beacons, yeah, and uh, and mostly south, actually, uh, mid-south, yeah. Because that's how you get to the Beacons, you're selling it, you're certainly selling it. Well, I, I quite we, agree weird, with you. Weirdly, though, I think that was one of the things, and for seasons one, two, and three, and on, and that's what Jane was sold me ultimately is, is is a bit like New Zealand for Lord of the Rings you know Wales offers uh, the key thing was to get the studio and the crew to a level where you can make those kinds of international shows um, and, but what Wales does offer is the locations that go with those shows and we can get everything and, that, and that's what New Zealand does and, and did and su survived through and that's what we're tapping into so yeah I mean it's all here and we um, are going to go slightly further afield as we get deeper into the seasons, I think. Next. Any more? Okay. Somebody got their hand up here. I'm sure this is very cliche, but what do you think your demon would be? What form do you think it would take? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you asking? Anyone. Any of them. <laughs> well, let's start with you, Lyra. Um, well, I think I'll have to go for a small tropical monkey because everyone calls me monkey on set. Oh, why do they do that? Because I'm very... Clever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's got to be a monkey. Yeah. But not, not like her. Not no, not golden. Mm. So Definitely not. Choose your demon. Oh. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's, uh, today is a different day, so I don't know what, what my demon will be. I'm probably not, um, I'm not an adult yet because it changed from, it's, it's, it's changed, it's changed. <laughs> Did I nick your answer? You stole stolen my answer. Okay, well in that case, I'm going to have a Pegasus. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> That's ambitious. There we go, a Pegasus. <laughs> but now, now you can have your answer. <laughs> what do you want, Ruth? No, I was just going to say, I'm, I, like, I haven't settled. Mine changes every day. Mm. So um, 
I don't think I've settled. I haven't gone through puberty yet. I but I, um, I love that idea of not settling. It's great. <laughs> I don't know. I'm feeling a bit sniffly and a bit, you know, sloth-like today. So that's what I feel. Sloth. <laughs> yeah, bit sloth, slow, lazy, <laughs> a bit grey. I think I ought to ask Jane and, and Joel if they've got any ideas for their, their demons. I mean, they, they can't just have all the fun just because they're cubs. Well, I, um, I started off... Um, we discuss this endlessly. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we're constantly casting other people's demons. Um, and, you know, one of the great fun things that Philip Pullman does is he often um, casts people who are dissatisfied with their demons. You know, you, you'll notice that the members of the magisterium normally tend to have small reptiles or wasps or spiders <laughs> or something. Um, so, uh, obviously, I, I started off feeling all puffed up with myself and thought, well, clearly my demon's a wolf. Um, obviously, it's bad wolf. You know, it's all just, you know, it's... And, but I realised at the end of this journey that my demon is actually a pit pony. Um, and uh, I, I, do, I do come from... My grandfather was a coal miner. I, uh, I realised that that role of a pit pony that just never gives up, I, I suddenly felt really comfortable and settled having realised that my demon was not actually a wolf, but it's a pit pony. So, <laughs> it's a journey. <laughs> Joe? I, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> no. Joe. Something twitchy. Something. <laughs> Something twitchy. Initially, I was going to say a bush baby. They've got big eyes and they <laughs> cling on to trees. But. Oh, this is a good game. Any more questions? <laughs> We've got time for a couple more. Um, not sure if I'm online or not, but uh, hello. Uh, I, uh, I've, I've got a tiny role in uh, season one and a slightly less tiny role in season we two. Spoilers. You raise your hands but, uh, we can't see you. We can't you. see you. Can't hello. see you at all. Okay. Right at the back. Oh. Uh, uh, all right. The back here. Thank you. Hello there. I can see your hand. Yeah. Now we can light. see you. Oh, I need to come into light, sorry. What's your name? Thank you. Hi, I'm Lex. Hello, Lex. Hi. Hello. Uh, I just want to ask a question as someone who has actually worked on the series but doesn't know the uh, the universe, doesn't know the material. Um, I, I've, I've seen the production and I'm absolutely amazed by the uh, production values. I think they've thrown uh, a, an incredible amount of artistic talent at the production. And it looks, every, every penny that they've spent is up there on the screen. It's absolutely amazing. But uh, I personally don't... Uh, Having not heard, read the novels, I don't know the uh, the story behind the the demons, the, the the avatars. I was wondering if there's someone on stage that might be able to explain those to me because oh. I, I find them fascinating, but I don't understand them having watched the first episode. Well, um, what is your name again, please, sir? Lex. Lex. Um, the first thing I would suggest is read the books. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I thought you were the going second, to do a whole discourse. The, sec the, the <laughs> second thing I would suggest is that if you can't read the books. Uh, stick with the series, I um, but the, but the demons, the demons, you know, you, you you've heard you've heard, <laughs> you, you've heard people say, oh, he's really a dog, you know, that person's a dog, or oh, that's one that's snake-like, or you know, that, look at that bird over there, you know, um, the demons, you know, according to Mr. Pullman, are uh, um, extensions of your soul, you know, that's what it, that's what it is, simply that, you know. Um, and other than that, you'll have to speak with Mr. Pullman to carry more, <laughs> to get more. <laughs> I feel as though you, you were dying to say something about demons. No, no, no. It was, uh, it was, uh, it's really interesting. It was when we were um, workshopping a bit early on before we started shooting the first season. It's really interesting because in the book, the demons are almost like subtext. They sort of reveal what the characters are thinking mm. underneath mm. the thought. So I might say something, um, but actually the monkey gives away what I'm really feeling. And it was interesting that that's, it was for an actor that takes away part of your job, weirdly. So we really discussed that. And I remember having a discussion about how you then negotiate mm. this relationship in a different way. Because now you have actors who can fill all those subtext feelings as well. And don't want to lose that side of performance. But how you then negotiate with your demon in a different way. And actually that's where I think we sort of dug as deep as Philip does, but really pushed the psychology of what these demons, how they interact with each other. And it's different from just playing the subtext. It's like they're so they have an interaction with each other and that kind of changes that goes on as a journey between the two of them because you are dealing with yourself. Mm. So that was really interesting. I remember we workshopped that and I, th I thought that was a challenge that we were going to have to sort of deal with as it went on. 
can we have? I kind of don't want to be upstaged by your demon. No, we all are, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. In, in yeah. performance. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, but I, I should just say, um, in, in case it's worrying everyone, where they're thinking, oh my God, I don't know what a demon is, and, and uh, it's really unclear, is that the whole of the first book, Northern Lights, our season one, is ex begins to explain what a demon is mm. um, and takes the demon through and the human relationship through various paces so that you are very sure about what it is about the end of the first season. Pullman takes that dramatist line of wondering is better than knowing, so he doesn't tell everything all at once. The second book is all about um, the theory of multiverses, and the third book is really all about dust and brings everything kind of like home. Um, so you will find out eventually, but you're not meant to know everything right from the start. So you can relax with that. Okay, so I wasn't really being cheeky about just read the book. You know. <laughs> Any, any more? Uh, whoever gets the microphone first, right up there. Hi, um, I'm Chloe. I'm a design student at Royal Welsh. Uh, I'm going to ask quite a vague question because I'd quite like you to answer it however you want. Um, when approaching uh, something like Hillsborough Materials that's so well established and everyone's got their own vision of it, as a designer, how do you even begin to come into that, especially knowing that you've got three series ahead of you, where does that, how does that begin? <laughs> well, I started from the third book and worked to the beginning because we had the luxury as filmmakers to basically understand that Philip had written the books as he went and we were able to work out as he went the gaps he filled in in the second book and the third and onwards. So we all worked quite carefully uh, deconstructing it from the back to the beginning and, um, and, and then carefully put back what we needed to and made sure we did the right threads in to the next seasons. Um, and for, for, the, for the opening of it, basically I just referenced it. It's mostly Dan May, who's over there, and I created a huge room full of imagery, which, um, which we sat with Jane and Dan, uh, the two execs. And the four of us kind of went through those images and pulled them off and ripped them up, and pulled them off and ripped them up, and then built it that way in a kind of very simple way. Um, so, and it was uh, mostly based on instinct and also fear. <laughs> <laughs> so it's hugely based on fear and anxiety. Hey, um, I think that is all. We've, we're all already <laughs> over time. Um, we need to collect our demons. Um, but I would just like to ask you to thank our wonderful panel, Joel Collins, Jane Tranter, <laughs> Daphne Keane, Clark Peters and Ruth Wilson. Really fascinating. Um, thank you all for coming and giving us such great attention. Joel from Young, Nostalgia.